Okay, as folks continue to come in, I'd like to welcome you. My name is Chelsea Lake. I'm a member of the events team at Politics and Prose Bookstore, and I'd like to welcome you to PMP Live. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping notes. At any point during the event, you can click on the link that I'll be dropping in the chat to purchase The Last Stargazers, The Enduring Story of Astronomy's Vanishing Explorers. You can ask a question by clicking on the Q&A. That feature can be found along the bottom of your screen. And keep in mind that that's separate from the chat. There's a chat and a Q&A. We'll try to get to everyone's questions, but I apologize in advance if we don't have time to address yours. We are delighted to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To access captions, simply click on the live transcripts option that's also along the bottom of your screen. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Emily Levesque is an astronomy professor at the University of Washington. She has observed for upward of 50 nights on many of the planet's largest telescopes and flown over the Antarctic stratosphere in an experimental aircraft for her research. Her academic accolades include the 2014 Annie Jump Cannon Prize, a 2017 Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship, and the 2020 Newton Lacey Pierce Prize. The Last Stargazers is her first popular science book. Professor Mario Livio is an internationally known astrophysicist, best-selling author, and a popular speaker. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He has published more than 500 scientific papers on topics ranging from dark energy and cosmology to black holes and extrasolar planets. Dr. Livio is also the author of seven popular science books, uh, including The Golden Ratio, Brilliant Blunders, and his most recent book, Galileo and the Science Deniers, which was selected by the Washington Post and Science News as one of the best books of 2020. And with that, I'll leave the screen to you all. Thank you very much, Chelsea, and thank you, Emily, for doing this. Um, thank you so much for joining me. <laughs> it is, um, it, I want to say that it's very appropriate that we are, we are doing this on January 8th. Uh, on, on January 8th, 1642, Galileo Galilei passed away. And on Ju January 8th, 1942, Stephen Hawking was born. So to have a conversation on astronomy on this date uh, is, is very, very appropriate. Emily. Uh Yes, I'll add yes. too, on, on January 8th, 2022, James Webb finished successfully deploying. This news was as of an hour or two ago. Yes, yes, finished <laughs> successfully deploying the mirror. Yeah, yes. great, excellent, <laughs> um, fantastic. Um, so Emily, I, I was uh, very pleased uh, to see when, uh, that when you were asked, uh, why did you choose astronomy and so on? you came up with an answer, something like that, you must have had to do that, um, which reminded me of George Mallory, the mountaineer, who when asked why he climbed Everest, he said, because it was there. Uh, but let me still press you a little bit harder on this question. Uh, you, you know, I mean, yes, okay, you are a curious as a scientist and you wanted to contribute to science and so on, but you know, you could have chosen to be a neuroscientist or something else. You still chose astronomy. So what was it in astronomy that you, you found so attractive? This is a great question. Thank you so much for asking it. And it's a question I talk about in The Last Stargazers. Um, I tell the story at the very beginning of the book about how where I can sort of trace back my interest in astronomy. And it really goes back to when I was a really small child. Uh, when I was two, in 1986, um, Halley's Comet made its most recent close flyby of our planet. 
And as part of that, my big brother was asked to observe the comet for school. So my whole family went out into my backyard and apparently I was a, you know, toddler, I was tired, I was scared of the dark and a little fussy until my parents had me look up and apparently I was mesmerized. And from then on, people would ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up and I would say, oh, I wanna be a ballerina or an astronomer or a firefighter or an astronomer. And as I got older and I knew I really loved science, this became a paleontologist or an astronomer, a marine biologist or an astronomer. But I think the beauty and bigness of space just caught me from the get-go and that always became something that I was curious about. Um, I also grew up in a family where there was a great deal of love and value placed on science, but I didn't have professional scientists in my family. I didn't know anyone who was a professional scientist. And there were some questions when I majored in physics and said I wanted to be an astronomer of, well, that's great, but what kind of jobs? are there in astronomy. And I was very kindly encouraged to look into engineering and all the amazing things you can do as an engineer or to look into the medical sciences. And I never really seriously did. I knew I was curious about space. And that's where I think the Mallory quote, because it's there, really comes in. I don't know quite why space is what hooked me instead of dinosaurs, but it seemed as it seemed to be an unarguable part of me that that was just something I had to study. Good, good. And tell me, astronomy is still a relatively broad field. Uh, you know, you can do galaxies, you can do black holes, you can do planets, you can do this. Uh, you chose to work on super giants and things like that. Um, so what led you, you know, to choose a particular subfield within astronomy? This, this is also a story I tell in the book, and I love it because I think a lot of scientists, when they talk about their specialty, have an answer like this. I sort of found my way into it. Um, even as a very little kid, when I thought about or got curious about space, I was especially fascinated by black holes. I loved how mysterious they were. I loved how they just stretched the limits of our minds and what we could understand about the universe. And when I got to college and I got my first opportunity to do research with um, an astronomer I still work with a lot today, Philip Massey, he asked me if I wanted to work on blue or red supergiants. And these are the types of stars he studies. Um, for viewers who don't know what these are, these are massive stars. They are at least eight times as massive as our sun. And they're exactly the types of stars that die and make a supernova and leave behind something like a black hole. These stars are blue when they're born and when they begin their lives, and then they're red near the ends of their lives. And he was asking me to choose between the blue and red stars. And I said, well, how about red? Because that's closer to being a black hole. And from there, when I actually did that first research project, I got mesmerized by the stars themselves about how something that might sound simple, like just a big ball of gas, could actually be so amazingly complicated. I got really excited about the physics of them, about how they evolve, about how they end their lives. And that kind of sent me down the rabbit hole of being curious about big dying stars. And it's I'm still fascinated by them today. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I can see that. I mean, and, and I read it, of course, in your book, but I want everybody who has still not read your book and hopefully will after this conversation uh, to, to know about that. Yeah, that, that's that's really uh, beautiful. And, uh, you know, in, in the book, you interview lots of astronomers, uh, more than 100 of them, actually. And I, I'm just curious a little bit about the technique, I mean, I mean, were you calling people up or sending them emails and say, OK, can I interview you about this or that and so on? How did this come about? How did you set that entire machinery uh, into motion? I am. Um... I, my background is as a professional astronomer. I don't have a background as an investigative journalist or an interviewer. So I knew going into this that this was going to be the most challenging part of the book for me is learning how to effectively interview and finding people to interview. And I wanted to interview as many people as possible. I was also writing the book while I was still working on getting tenure at the University of Washington. So I knew I couldn't take time off and fully work on just the book. I wound up fitting a lot of interviews into the sorts of things we already do 
day to day as astronomers. If I was invited to speak about my research at a university, I would email people and say, I'm about to be at your school. Will you sit down with me for half an hour to answer questions about your experiences as an astronomer, your experiences working at telescopes for me to record? I took a few special trips. I visited the Carnegie Observatories in Washington, Kitt Peak in Arizona, Mauna Kea in Hawaii to specifically try and seek out people who were very close to those types of observing facilities. I visited Las Campanas in Chile. Um, but a lot of the interviews were interviews of opportunity when I was at a conference or at a department. Um, I would ask people, who else should I be talking to? And they would pass on names who I would then seek out. Um, some people I did just interview over Skype or email, including folks I hadn't met previously saying, I would like to interview for this book you for this book and almost everybody took me up on it, which was wonderful, but it was cobbled together as the opportunities came up. By the way, before you became a professional astronomer, when you were just studying or, or even when deciding to study, did you already know that this particular profession involves a lot of traveling and to all kinds of exotic places and so on? Was that part of the of your thinking or that you know sort of learned as you went into it you know that aspect of astronomy completely took me by surprise i imagined astronomy or i imagined scientific research period as you sort of sit in a room and think and maybe the room has a computer maybe you talk to other scientists but i assumed you worked at a university and sort of stayed there and I had no idea until I got to college that you would travel all over the planet to go to really remote telescopes, to go to conferences, to meet with collaborators. Um, I liked the idea of visiting the world, but I hadn't grown up fantasizing about travel. And the fact that astronomy has now really introduced me to my own planet has been one of the most surprising but exciting side perks of the field that I could have imagined. Yeah. Uh now, there is a certain, um, even from the title of your book, you know, The Last Stargazers, uh, I, I get this feeling about, um, you know, losing a certain romantic side of astronomy uh, in that, uh, and you talk about this in, in the book, you know, in, in that, you know, astronomy used to be about these people who would sit at the tele their telescope somewhere at some remote mountain and something and, uh, you know, with no light in the dome and uh, things like that and so on. And, uh, and a few people to talk to uh, uh, all, entire nights and, and so on. And that is, uh, you know, disappearing at some level. Uh, you, you know, you, your last chapter is about the LSST, which is a large facility where, you know, everything is becoming so automated that uh, at some level you, you can do observing today without ever seeing a telescope almost uh, yeah. and so on. Do you feel uh, that loss kind of the, that romantic part of astronomy? I, I do feel like losing the history and the way that we used to observe and the sort of absorb, absorbing spend all night at the telescope type of observing is sad. And I talked to lots of astronomers who had spent years observing by capturing images on delicate glass plates and shivering in domes all night. And what's interesting is none of those folks demanded that era back. Everyone loves the gains of modern technology, of computational tools, of digital astronomy. Some of these are the same folks who are incredibly excited to see what LSST and Rubin Observatory are going to show us in terms of this enormous automated survey those telescopes are doing of the night sky. So nobody wanted to hit rewind, but everybody wanted to tell those stories. Everyone's favorite astronomy memory wasn't, I opened up my laptop and data had arrived. It was all some version of, I was standing on a mountain and it was beautiful. So you mentioned the title of the book and the last stargazers can sound depressing. And it's partly a challenge that we shouldn't be the last stargazers, that there's room for all types of observing 
in astronomy. There's room for all types of telescopes. If we can continue supporting the field, we can do our science in a variety of different ways, which is good for the science. But it is sort of writing down stories from this era that we won't get back and making sure that this very unusual field and this very quirky way of doing research is saved for, you know, posterity. I, I, I want to tell you a, not a very glorious story from my past like this. I'm a theoretical astrophysicist, which means I hardly know from which side of the telescope one looks. Uh, but at one time when I was really young, I decided that, you know, it is yeah, what I'm dealing with is astrophysics. So I need to see once how you observe and so on. And I went to a small telescope, a one meter telescope. Um, and I arrived there at night and nobody tell, told me anything. And it was a time when you couldn't light any light inside the dome. And I arrived after dark and nobody told me that there was no railing around the platform. And I actually fell off the platform. Oh uh, no. Yes, I fell off the platform. And I think maybe that's when I decided that I'm definitely <laughs> gonna become a theoretical astrophysicist rather than an observational astronomer. So yes, you can add this to your collection of stories. Anyhow, um, <laughs> there is a, a class of objects which you observed at, and even uh, at one point, um, you know, found a candidate of an object that has been uh, predicted to exist for a long time, uh, but none were known. Uh, I'm talking, of course, about Thorn Zhitkov object. Uh, I, I know yes. of course, both Anna Zhitkov and Kip Thorne, and I've known knew about their object for many, many years. And I also, I'm a personal friend with Philip Podziadlowski, who wrote quite a bit of the theories about what those stars should look like. Um, and so tell us a little bit of what those things are, because they are truly fascinating. And, uh, you know, how did you go about trying to study them? Yes, these are these are my favorite objects in my sort of research repertoire right now. And they are my favorite kind of science because they're weird, hard to explain, still very mysterious stars that we're trying to figure out. So Thorn Zhitkov objects are named for Kip Thorne and Anna Zhitkov, who are the two astronomers that first predicted that they should exist back in the 1970s. And the idea is that these are stars that outwardly look like normal red supergiants. If you were to see one in the sky, it would look like Betelgeuse. It would just look like another star, a little red, a little bright, but not that unusual. What marks these stars as strange is that their cores aren't supported by the fusion processes that support every other star we know about. Betelgeuse, our sun, Every star that we see in the night sky is supported by fusing hydrogen into helium or helium into carbon in its core. That fusion keeps the star shining. It keeps it from collapsing. It's under its, under its own gravity. But thorn Zhitkov objects are different. They have as their cores neutron stars. So these are these tiny, dense, leftover husks of massive stars that have already died as supernovae. And those are actually supported by very exotic principles of quantum physics. So a thorn Zhitkov object outwardly looks like a normal star, but it's supported from, by this really strange, dense central object. Um, when Kip and Anna predicted these, it was a completely new model for how stars could work. And they predicted them theoretically. They said, well, the physics says a star like this should work, but they had never seen evidence of one. They did this work in the 70s. Decades later, my colleagues and I were studying red supergiants, and Phil Podziadlowski was actually the first person to ever mention Thorn Zhitkov objects to me. And shortly after he and I talked, Anna Zhitkov actually emailed me and said, I see you're studying red supergiants. It's possible that a Thorn Zhitkov object might look like a slightly strange red supergiant. Have you ever thought about looking for them? So we conducted a an observing survey for these. To our amazement, we found one star that actually resembles what we think a Thorn Zhitkov object should look like. It has very odd amounts of certain elements in its atmosphere that we think would only come from a neutron star core. And I'm still working with um, Philip Massey and other colleagues and research students here at the University of Washington on trying to find more stars like these, on trying to figure out where they come from or how common they might be. 
but they look to be proof of a whole new way that stars can work, which is just an exciting discovery to have made. Yeah, of course, uh, like always, you know, the late uh, Carl Sagan told us that, uh, you know, extraordinary discoveries require extraordinary proof. And, uh, you know, when you come and say, oh, I discovered the thorn Zhitkov object, there will immediately be 10 other astronomers uh, who will try to point out to you that there are seven other explanations that can explain those observations and it not being a thorn Zhitkov object. And I believe that also happened with your first uh, candidate. Uh, oh, yes. The, I mean, we, we are still very insistent on calling it a candidate. It's the best candidate we found for a thorn Zhitkov object. Um, we actually had a little trouble getting our, um, getting our discovery published because the first journal we went to wanted us to claim we had found one. They said, we don't want to publish candidates. We want to publish a discovery. And we were very clear on, well, we can't say for sure. We've had colleagues write very carefully done papers where they tried to look at the chemical, um, the chemical makeup of the star and say, couldn't this be something else? Or who tried to study the position of the star and say, are you sure the star is even in the galaxy you think it is? Could it be closer or farther away? And every time they wrote a paper like that, it made us go back and scrutinize our data more carefully. So far, the data have always borne out in favor of this star being a thorn Zhitkov object, but that sort of scrutiny and examination of our science is exactly what makes it strong. Had we at some point been proven wrong, that would have been invaluable information for continuing to study stars like this. So it's, it's a nice example of the scientific process working well. Right. Uh, tell me something. I, I want you to tell us a little bit about you know, your journey as a young astronomer. I mean, for example, at high school, were you considered the nerd? Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, and after that, you know, you, you know, starting as a young astronomer and especially also a young female astronomer in a field that today already actually starts perhaps approaching, you know, uh, equi an equilibrium of maybe maybe not quite 50-50, but maybe, I don't know, 35, 65 or something like that. But when you started, I think it was still heavily, you know, weight again towards uh, uh, male astronomers. Uh, so tell us a little bit about, about that and your experiences and so on. Yeah, so I was absolutely a nerd in high school. And I was one of the only nerds. I was occasionally teased or felt sort of apart from my, um, my, the other students that I went to school with because everybody else was into sports and I just wanted to read about the moon landing. And getting to college and going to MIT was absolutely wonderful because suddenly I was with groups of people who other thought I was cool because I knew about other, the moon landing. Yes. Sorry? Well, with other nerds suddenly. Exactly. And it was a great chance to be able to sort of flourish and really explore those opportunities in detail. Um, growing up, my gender did not come up that much. Nobody, my family, my teachers never said to me, isn't it nice that you like science even though you're a girl? Or isn't it nice that you're a girl doing science? They just liked that I was a person that enjoyed science, which I think was an amazing way to open that door for me as a young person. Um, and for a long time at MIT, my entering class was about 50-50 men and women. And looking back on it, there were fewer women in my physics classes. Um, it actually took me a while to realize that I had almost no female um, professors in physics and astronomy. That hadn't caught my attention at the time because I was so busy just trying to keep up in the classes that it didn't register. But it's nice to look around the field now and see uh, myself and a number of female colleagues who are science professors at University of Washington to see a female president of the American Astronomical Society. Um, you mentioned that we're getting closer to 50-50. I know that in 2017, 40% of astronomy PhDs were awarded to women. So it's nice to see the field making these sorts of strides. I also write in the book about the women who sort of came in the generations before me in the field who really had to sort of fight and deal with absurd, unnecessary obstacles to do their research. And physics and astronomy is challenging already when you throw in not being able to get telescope access because women aren't allowed to lead telescope time or women who aren't allowed to stay on the mountain where the telescopes are. There were people who worked incredibly hard 
to sort of tear those barriers down. And there's people still working hard to keep pushing a more equitable field today. So I'm glad that it has been effective and I'm glad there are still people putting in the work to keep that true. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, there have been even worse times, you know, in 1900, I mean, women were not allowed to even study mathematics at the university and things yeah. like that. So, uh, so things have definitely improved, although there is still room for further improvement. Uh, I want to touch on another topic, which is actually close to my heart, uh, and I hope that to yours as well, which is I am uh, alarmed by the degree of science denial that we are encountering today. Um, and it, this, is a, a bi this had actually a big part in the fact that I wrote the books, uh, you know, Galileo and the science deniers. Um, so we are seeing this more and more, and we are seeing this in topics that are even truly dangerous, you know, like climate change, like the COVID pandemic and things like that and so on. I, I want to hear a little bit your take on, you know, how do you feel about that problem? And do you have any ideas of how to combat that, you know, or what to do about it? I agree with you that I've, the problem's really alarming. And I sometimes wonder about putting myself in a position of saying how we can combat it because it's so hard for me to wrap my head around as somebody who's loved science her entire life and who puts so much weight and so much value on the scientific method and scientific scrutiny it's hard to think about how you how somebody could just turn their back on that at the same time i think these are people that are so important to talk to and to convince um i think one way that i would try to approach it is actually the same approach that both you and i have taken in our books of making sure that people understand how science is really done, understand the people that are doing science and try to put a human face on science. I think people who are denying science aren't doing so because they dislike science as a concept. It comes from a mistrust or it comes from a dislike of what science is telling them. And I've talked to people who say, well, I'm not sure I trust scientists. Scientists, uh, they can't be like normal people. They don't understand day-to-day -day life struggles. They are just very separate from the rest of the world. And I think it's helpful to humanize scientists and to make the way that we do science very clear and to explain to people that they do, just by virtue of asking questions about the world, have the ability to explore science and ask scientific questions. And what they need to do is recognize how people do that professionally and why it's important. And I hope that by improving a trust of scientists, you and making sure that scientists earn that trust, but improving a trust of scientists is the way to make sure that people will come to believe and support science more. I agree. And by the way, I should mention to the people who listen in uh, that uh, at the end of this conversation, uh, in about 10 minutes or so, uh, we will open these two uh, uh, questions and answers, which, uh, you know, you can uh, write into the chat box those questions, and uh, Chelsea, uh, who introduced us, uh, will read uh, the questions, and, uh, well, who, to whomever the question is directed, whether Emily or me, we will try to answer the best we can. So. We encourage you to, to ask questions at the end of this. This is exactly part of this idea of trying to make science and scientists more accessible to, to people uh, in, in general. Uh, you see, I, I, I want to say something a little bit more about this topic because there are psychological studies which demonstrate again and again that once adults form an opinion about something, it is extremely difficult to change their opinion. Even when you confront them, you know, with completely contradictory evidence. Uh, and unfortunately, we see this today quite a bit, uh, that that is the case. Um, and, uh, you know, I've given a lot of thought to what can we do, you know? So one thing which you, in some sense, um, you know, almost uh, in, per, in your person, you exemplify 
is this business of starting from with small children. Uh, not all small children need to be scientists. God forbid. We need, you know, all the authors and the writers and the, and the musicians and the artists and everybody. But we do need that everybody will have some sort of an appreciation of what science is and what science achieves. And, and, and this has to be taught from when people are small children. And the mm-hmm. second thing is something that almost you and I cannot do, which is the following. People are more convinced if you bring them somebody who once had their, opin- their opinion and changed his or her mind, as mm-hmm. opposed to you know us who always liked science, come and say, look, science is so important, you know, and so on. You should be curious about science. So uh, that's another way that I sort of discovered that I think, you know, maybe maybe of interest. Good. Uh, Let's see. Let's move on. Uh, uh, Please. You want to say something? So I wanted to follow up on your point that it's really hard to change people's minds and that it often helps to sort of meet them where they are or introduce them to people like them who have changed their minds or who have grown in their thinking. And one thing that I found interesting and something that I think might contribute to science denial or science skepticism is people who have opinions about themselves that might be hard to change, saying, well, I was never good at math. I was never good at science. My math teacher in high school was a jerk. I would, And they start to see it as something that isn't for them. And I think changing our minds about ourselves is just as hard as anything else. But it's why when I talk to children or when I talk to adults, I try to make clear, and this is for folks who might be asking questions, there is no such thing as a bad question if it comes from a place of curiosity. That if you want to ask a question about, well, what's the difference between stars and planets? Or do we really think there are aliens out there? Those are great scientific questions. And having the confidence to ask them and to learn about the answer is really, it, that's really the best possible place to start. So if we can get folks who are skeptical of science, skeptical, but asking questions and understanding what the answer, where the answers are coming from. It's a good first step. And we just want to continue from there to make sure that they understand and listen to the scientists that are giving them the answers. You know, a great French astrophysicist, uh, late and by now, Evry Schatzman, you, you may have heard the name, Uh, Mm -hmm. He once told me when I was very young, just starting in the profession, he told me there are no silly questions. There are only silly answers. (laughs) So (laughs) I wanted to encourage me to ask uh, many questions. Uh, (laughs) Tell me something. Um, This is just, I'm just curious. Uh, You've met many astronomers and you have interviewed many astronomers and so on. Um, Is there one astronomer that sort of stands out to you as, you know, as maybe the person that you always thought, aha, this is what I want to be when I grow up or something. Um, it's, I, I can think of a couple answers to that. And one is an astronomer that I actually have not yet had the chance to meet or interview, but I remember seeing her on TV and she was at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, and this was back in 1994. Um, when I was about nine years old. And this was when the comet Schumacher-Levy 9 impacted Jupiter. And this was a huge event at the time. We were getting to watch a comet hit another planet. We were so curious about what that impact would look like, what it would do to the planet. And we had this beautiful new Hubble Space Telescope that we could use to make the observations. And I remember watching this event on TV and seeing the pictures come in from Hubble and they were astonishing. You could see this big bright scar from the comet hitting Jupiter. And then I remember seeing a video of scientists at the Space Telescope Science Institute all crowded around a computer. And there was a woman sitting right in the middle of it. And she was wearing big glasses, like the kind that I had, like the kind that I got teased for. She was, everybody in that room was clearly dressed like a nerd. It was great. And they were so happy. They were excited. They were practically jumping up and down, cheering and looking at each other with amazement as the pictures came in on a computer screen. And, sorry? That was Heidi Hamill. 
Yes. Yep. And I haven't yet gotten the chance to meet her in person and tell her about this, but I remember that sticking in my head going, I want to be friends with those people and look at how much fun they're having. I could be a scientist and have this much fun too. So any scientist that I talked to who had that sort of enthusiasm and who could get me excited about the story they were telling, I always loved hearing from. Another person I have to mention too is a um, co former colleague of mine here at the University of Washington. He sadly passed away recently, but George Wallerstein, who was a giant of stellar astrophysics research and had, when I interviewed him, observed for 30 years with sort of old school astronomy technology, had observed with glass photographic plates sitting in the dome and shivering away all night as he observed. He had then observed for 30 years with modern tools and digital imagers and remote observations where he could operate a telescope from a computer in his office. And the stories he was able to tell me and the thoughts that he had on how the field had evolved and how much technology had helped us, but at the same time, how the job of astronomers had changed. It was such an invaluable perspective to have. So I was really happy to be able to write about his stories in particular in the book and a lot of colleagues of his that really had similar perspectives on their their career and their life. Yeah, he was also such a wonderful person and he also loved to climb mountains and to fly airplanes and he really had a very, very full life, no, no question. I th I think I describe him in the book as the most interesting man in the world. He was a boxing champion, a pilot, a mountain climber, a lifelong humanitarian. He's a fascinating man. <laughs> you know that if you will look yeah. on Wikipedia, who is the most interesting person in the world, you will find somebody who appeared in some beer commercial. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because that's the title they gave him. <laughs> oh, yeah. George is the real life version of that. <laughs> that's right. Uh, yes. Um, is there something I didn't ask you, which you would like uh, perhaps to, to tell us before we open it to Q&A? No, I think these were great questions. Um, I think we've touched on a lot of the main themes of my book, sort of looking at how technology has changed astronomy and how our job as stargazers has changed. Um, the importance of putting a human face on science and what that means in terms of how we understand and trust science. Like, I, I think we've covered it pretty well and I'd, I'd love to move to taking people's questions. Um, oh, okay, the, the, let me just say before I open it to questions that, um, you know, and she didn't say this, but Emily's book is a very personal book. Um, it's, uh, yes, it tells the story of astronomy, but it tells, it tells Emily's stories of astronomy. Uh, and as such, it is uh, actually much more fascinating because there are many books who will tell you about the history of astronomy and I don't know what and so on. Uh, but only Emily can write a book that tells Emily stories of, of astronomy. And as such, I, I strongly recommend it. And now, uh, Chelsea, we can open it, I believe, to Q&A. Of course, great. And again, I want to encourage folks, we'll still have time. Um, but there is still time to ask your question using the Q&A feature. If you're not sure where that is, it's along the bottom of your screen. If you're still not sure, you can throw it in the chat and I'll find it there as well. So at the top um, from Mark, how optimistic are you that JWST will be a success? What are you most hoping to see? Oh, thank you for asking this question. Um, this is a great day to address this because um, the James Webb Space Telescope just finished the long process of sort of unfurling and unfolding itself to be ready to observe. It opened its big main mirror today. Um, now that that has happened successful, successfully, I think its odds of success have gone up immensely. Um, this was one of the most complicated, I think the most complicated thing we've attempted to do in space. And it's amazing and speaks to the folks at NASA and the Space Telescope Science Institute that it worked. Um, I am very interested in studying the same stars that I've been studying with Hubble and with ground-based telescopes with James Webb. These stars, red supergiants, 
emit a lot of light in the same wavelengths that James Webb is designed for. Hubble looks at the same light that we all see with our eyes, and James Webb detects light that's much redder than that, infrared light. These stars are really interesting to look at in infrared light because we can take a look at how they sort of evolve as they near the ends of their lives. They'll do things like puff off the outermost layers of the stars. Those layers then turn into dust grains that we can see glowing in infrared light. We can measure the chemistry of that dust, figure out where it came from, how the star shed it, what it's doing to the star's sort of final evolution. So it'll be a really interesting tool specifically for studying stars like this. And I'm looking forward to seeing what we see once the mirror commissioning is finished, the instrument commissioning is finished, and we start getting back our first pictures from Webb. Okay. Okay, we've I, got one. I, oh, I, yes, please. If I may, I will, I will add my personal <laughs> hopes for, for a Webb too. Um, so first of all, of course, we all hope that it will all work and so far so good. I mean, I, I knock on, on everything around me. Uh, you yeah. know, it has 200 uh, potential points or single failure point, points uh, along the way, but it has passed a few major milestones, you know, opening the sun shield, now opening the mirror and, and so on. Um, I, I hope very much that uh, the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to characterize the atmospheres of some extrasolar planets. Uh, these are planets revolving around their parent stars. Uh, and uh, there is a hope that at least in some cases, uh, the James Webb will be able to tell us something, well, first of all, about the existence of those atmospheres, and second, perhaps even about the composition of those atmospheres, which can tell us something about in principle, even about whether it, you know one could think about life in, in those places or not. So uh, this is one of the great things that Webb perhaps will be able to do. Okay, great. Uh, we have a question from Robert. He asks, the title of the book is The Last Stargazers, but there are hundreds of thousands of highly enthusiastic stargazers in the US alone. We also call them amateur astronomers. And some of these stargazers do sophisticated scientific research and get their data published in leading scientific journals, such as Icarus and the Astrophysical Journal. Does your book discuss amateur astronomers and their contribution to astronomy popularization and research? Uh, first, excellent question. And I have I work with data that amateur astronomers take. Um, there is an amazing online resource where amateur astronomers study variable stars, so stars that brighten and dim. I have students working with that data literally right now, and their contribution to astronomy is amazing. Um, when I wrote The Last Stargazers, I realized that I had to limit the scope of the book in some way or else it would wind up being even more over my publisher's word count than I wound up being. And I realized that I had to cut out space astronomy and focus on astronomy being done on the ground. And I had to cut out amateur astronomy and focus on what the life of a professional astronomer was like. I wanted the book to sort of be that behind the scenes glimpse of what it meant to do this job as your profession. I think somebody could write an entire book about the contributions that amateur astronomers have made over the years and about the wide definition that we can apply to amateur astronomers, because it's true. This goes from people who think the night sky is beautiful and like to look at it with a stargazing app on their phone to help them find things, all the way up to folks with extraordinarily sophisticated professional level observatories in their backyards or operated remotely who publish, but who do this amazingly as a hobby rather than as their full-time job. And despite it not being their full-time job, they make professional contributions. So it's an amazing breadth of topic that I would love to see someone cover. It would have doubled the book's length. And since I am not an amateur astronomer, I didn't think I could do it justice, but I would love to see that book written. Okay, we've got another one here uh, on James Webb Telescope from Jean-Paul. In light of the James Webb telescope is all of humanity entering a cloud of unknowing where our assumptions, theories, and understanding dissolve. What does James Webb telescope, Telescope's journey mean for all of us? 
Ah, this, this is a good question because it's getting at the idea that once James Webb sort of turns on and starts observing, it might show us surprising things or it might show us new things. Um, something that I found amazing about Hubble and about a lot of new telescopes as we build them is how wonderfully they test our current scientific theories and amazingly how often scientific theories developed with earlier generations of telescope wind up being correct. And at the same time, we constantly are seeing surprises. We're spotting things like Thorn Jitgov objects. We're doing things like pointing Hubble at what looks like an empty patch of sky and getting back a picture, picture that's just an ocean of galaxies. I don't think James Webb is going to disassemble our understanding of the universe, far from it. I think it's going to help enhance it. I think there are heaps of people, astronomers have already submitted, I believe over a thousand proposals to use James Webb, all with theories they want to test or new bits of data they want to try and fit into a bigger puzzle. And I don't think the expectation is that long held theories will be shattered, although certainly we might find data that challenges some things that we understand. I think that mainly James Webb is just going to become a really valuable new tool for building and refining our understanding of how the universe works. Let me add just a couple of words to that. Yes, what Emily just said is, is absolutely correct. And the idea is that we always try to push the boundary even further and even further. So in this particular case, for example, you know, Hubble has shown us galaxies to when the universe was, you know, maybe 5% its current age, uh, things like that. James Webb will show us almost the very earliest galaxies that formed in the universe. So yes, we will see the building blocks of today's galaxies and so on, but it, it is not expected to, you know, completely dismantle our current view of the, of the universe. There will be surprises, no doubt. Uh, there, there will be things that, like with Hubble, where, you know, we will see some things which we didn't think that we will even observe. Uh, th these are the types of things. Uh, uh, Emily just mentioned uh, the Hubble field, you know, that you look at the, at the blank piece of sky and you see there are 10,000 galaxies. I mean, that was not one of the things that originally people say, oh, Hubble is going to do that. And, and things like that. So surely there will be surprises, but it's it's not going to dissolve suddenly all of our knowledge, and uh, we have to start from scratch. Okay, great. There are a couple here that I want to snag in the chat. Uh, uh, okay, your enthusiasm for astronomy is so infectious. I'm a late to the game backyard amateur. And I could not agree more about the enjoyment of hands-on astronomy, despite the cold, clouds, and lack of sleep. Love your writing. Could you talk a little bit about the role amateurs have played? Well, we've, we've kind of gotten into that a little bit. Um, amateurs have played on increasing interest and trust in science. I've found letting kids look through a telescope is like flipping a switch to their imagination and curiosity. I know we've touched on that. Is there anything more? that you'd like to add in particular about kids? Oh, I, I'd love to add a little bit about backyard astronomy because again, this is how I got um, into it at first, either just standing in the backyard looking at Halley's Comet or growing up, um, we had a little eight inch backyard telescope that we would use and we had a couple great pairs of binoculars. Um, I think any chance you have to sort of get out and look at the night sky and be curious about it is great, um, regardless of your age, but it's especially excellent for kids. Um, for folks who are, in, who are with us who aren't necessarily full, uh, fully equipped backyard astronomers. I often have people ask me, you know, what type of telescope should I buy? How do I get into this field? It seems expensive. Backyard telescopes can be really complicated and you can do amazing backyard astronomy with the naked eye. With a pair of binoculars, you can get an amazing look at the moon. You can get a nice look at the little dots of say Jupiter and Saturn. Um, if you do have the chance to go to an astronomy open house and look through a little backyard telescope, it's amazing what you can see. So whatever opportunity you have to get into into that is worth taking and you don't necessarily need a telescope that's thousands of dollars or a completely dark remote site. I remember observing Mars in the middle of Boston in the middle of city lights and still being able to see it. So I think that that source of enthusiasm is a really valuable one, but it can come from anywhere. So any type of 
amateur astronomy is great. Okay, and uh, there's, and I'm gonna bounce back to the Q&A because there's a similar question from Victor. I was passionate about astronomy as a little boy in the 50s. And is it H.A. Ray? H.A. or Ha Ray uh, taught me to see constellations in person. But when I started college at Cal and audited graduate classes, I became aware that I was not gifted in mathematics. So I left my ambition. I always wondered whether there is a place even today in astronomy for people who are not gifted mathematically? Ah, um, so another excellent question. Uh, and, and there's two things I wanna bring up with this. First of all, there absolutely is a place in the field of science for folks, even if they're not looking for a job that's mathematically intensive, the immediate one that comes to mind right now is science journalism. Um, that if you are conversant enough in the science and the mathematics to talk to researchers and understand their results and read and discuss with them their research papers, that's an invaluable skill. And being able to communicate a complicated scientific result to an audience through the power of good writing, like that that's some of the most important th work that any scientist or person in the field can do. Um, I would also argue that it's very easy for us to think of math especially, but science as well to a certain extent is something that um, you tend to just sort of get gifted with and you're excellent at it or you're not and that's the way it goes. And I absolutely remember struggling with some of my classes in college and thinking, oh gosh, am I going to be able to handle this? And fighting through to get a passing grade, not necessarily an excellent grade, but learning the material along the way. So I would say that if you would if you want to work on something that is less mathematically oriented and more in the vein of science communication or other aspects of the field, then that's fantastic. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't want somebody to think, well, I'm not naturally perfect at math, so therefore I can't do it. It's oftentimes a skill that has to get sort of fought for and learned, even for scientists, even for folks that people might think were just always good at it. Okay. Uh, from Jason, I would like to know how many people you interviewed um, and got to meet during this process, get to meet during interviewing all the astronomers. And then I'm going to um, piggyback that with a question from Kelly, which are your favorite observatories, um, which what is the most fascinating thing you have seen? So I interviewed 112 astronomers for the book, um, and I met even more. Um, I have 112 interviews recorded, transcripted, that went into the stories that make up the book. Um, and I did this, as I described, by sort of meeting people when I visited departments or when I went to conferences. I did get to do some of these interviews at observatories. I think if I had to pick a favorite observatory, it's very hard to pick because they're all fantastic and it's, you know, it's like kids, you love them all in a different way. Um, an observatory that I always thoroughly enjoy visiting is Las Campanas Observatory, which is an observatory in Chile. Chile is one of the best places on the planet for astronomy. And Las Campanas in particular is an observatory that right up until the COVID-19 pandemic operated in a very classical way. Um, you would apply, write something like a grant application to be given a night or two of time on the telescope. You would fly to Santiago, you would fly to La Serena, you would get in a tr you would get in a van, you would drive for a couple hours, you would move into the dormitory, and you would be at the telescope doing the observing. It's such an unbelievably beautiful place. It's got some of the darkest sky I've ever seen. I write about Las Campanas in particular and how beautiful it is in The Last Stargazers. If I had to pick a favorite, I think that would very narrowly edge out my other favorite observatory, which is Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Another case of one of the best places on the planet for astronomy, a place that is so beautiful and that we're so incredibly lucky to get to observe at. So it's hard to pick, but I think Chile and Hawaii have to be right up there. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, from Barbara, a question for both of you. With the huge expansion via technology of sharing research, do you feel there is true camaraderie internationally now, or have researchers become more protective? The joining of sciences and the arts and psychology in the last three decades is also very exciting too. Mario, do you want to answer that one first or should I? 
Why don't you answer first? It's, it's your event. I will add something. Sure. <laughs> um, I think that the best science that we do always comes from collaboration and camaraderie. Um, some of the most amazing discoveries that we've made even in the past decade have come from thousands of people working as a team. Uh, the one that I can most immediately think of is in 2015, we successfully detected gravitational waves. So these tiny ripples in the fabric of space time coming from things like two enormous black holes colliding. That project was decades in the making. It took heaps of astronomers and physicists and engineers and support staff and that required thousands of people's worth of effort. Uh, you might remember the black hole, our first picture of a black hole that came out in 2019. That was another huge team. Um, the work that we've just seen done on James Webb was the result of an enormous collaboration. I think collaboration is absolutely key. And I actually write in The Last Stargazers a little bit about the huge teams that make projects like this possible and the role that like you said, protectiveness and competition can sometimes make. And astronomers wanting to prove each other right or wrong and wanting to make sure that our science is properly scrutinized is a critical part of research. I've seen examples where people will try to race each other and who and people will might potentially be driven to be first rather than being right. And our best science never comes out of that process. It always comes when the race is either to get to the right answer or whether the race is a group of people working together and, you know, racing time or racing the universe to find an answer. Um, so that's, and I agree with you that the merger of um, the sciences and the arts is also wonderful too. I think the better we can express our science and communicate our science, the better off we'll be. But I like seeing that camaraderie, whether it's between scientists or between fields. Uh, let me just add one thing because Emily explained it very well. Uh, it, today, uh, science is such, for example, in the field of astrophysics, that big discoveries rarely come, even not just from a single person, but not even from a single observatory. Uh, the big discoveries come from the combination of data from several facilities. So. For example, you know, you, you, we mentioned discoveries that the Hubble Space Telescope was involved in, such as that the expansion of our universe is speeding up, is accelerating. But that did not come solely from Hubble. It was a combination of ground-based and Hubble observations. Uh, even even the, the thing that Emily mentioned about gravitational waves, uh, the, yes, the gravitational wave detector is one facility, but when two neutron stars collided, it was the combination of optical data and other data with the gravitational wave signal that told us what it was that we're seeing and so on. So it's not just many people working on a single project that contributed. It is even many people working on many projects that contribute to discoveries today. I'm so glad you brought up the neutron star collision because I was thinking of that while you were describing this. Um, that the so gravitational waves were generated from two neutron stars colliding. A gravitational wave detector picked it up, and a space a gamma ray space telescope picked up signs of this collision. I think the final total was that 71 telescopes, either on Earth or in space, took part in the first you know day or day and a half of observations. And that's that's not all of them, but that's a very substantial fraction of all of the professional telescopes in the world. And I had I talked to colleagues about this. They were sending me emails. They were sending me chat threads where groups were chatting with each other, chatting across groups and frantically trying to chase down observations of this event as soon as it happened. And it, it flourished by having all of these groups and all of these resources pooled all at once. Wonderful. Okay, so we've got a minute left. <clears throat> I thought, <clears throat> excuse me, we could end up, we've got two questions in the Q&A that are both about science denials. Lawrence um, asked a wonderful question, and I'm going to read it and then end with an anonymous question um, from an anonymous attendee. It's more lighthearted. And Lawrence's question is, uh, people who are hostile to science often seem to think that scientists think they know everything and have all the answers. Of course, any scientist or anyone who loves science knows that the motive force of science is that we still don't know. 
How do we get that across to the science skeptics in a way that will make them more appreciative of science rather than interpreting it as undermining, undermining science entirely? And then quickly, the last question was, uh, speaking of science denial, denial, did you see Don't Look Up, the movie, and what did you think? So, so I'll touch on this question of how we convince science deniers, um, because yeah, there is often this frustration of, oh, science Scientists think they know everything, and I've had people question discoveries to me saying, well, haven't they ever considered that they could be wrong? And this is where I think putting a human face on science helps, because I think I think most of us spend most of our time considering that we could be wrong and testing our own ideas and scrutinizing them. And the importance comes from saying that thinking, oh, something could be wrong isn't science in and of itself, it's the first step of science. If we thought that our discovery of a thorn Jitkov object might be wrong, and we have colleagues who did, we, our obligation was to go back to the science and back to the data and look at what we had in front of us as closely as possible and then come back and with care either say, you know, we were wrong, this is something else, or no, we checked, we were right, and here's why. And being able to ask questions but then support the answers with evidence is what key to science. I think I think it's good for people to know that we question ourselves and test ourselves regularly, but that it's not done for the sake of being contrary or the sake of saying, well, what if something else is true? It's done because we really do want to get to the most fundamental truth we can. Uh, let me add just one sentence to that. Uh, scientists actually normally are the first to admit that what they say is provisional. It's only as correct as the available data can tell. Uh, but the great thing about science is that it self-corrects. And sometimes the self-correction can take a week, sometimes it can take 100 years. But science continuously self-corrects. And that's the real strength of science. Not in being correct immediately and all the time but in self-correcting all the time. Absolutely. Did either of you see the movie uh, Don't Look Up? It's I think it's about a meteor barreling towards Earth. I, I have seen it. Yeah, I have seen it. It's amusing. Yeah. Amusing. <laughs> I've, I've seen it as well. It's, I mean, it's, I like to think that we can tell stories and imagine a world in which we are better than what's shown in the movie, although I certainly recognize some characters in the film. Um, it's denial all over the place. There. Absolutely. And I know a lot of folks who I'd like to think we can reach better than the folks that were depicted in that movie. I will say, if you did enjoy Don't Look Up, the telescope that the whole movie starts at, it starts with a young woman graduate student observing at the Subaru Observatory atop Mauna Kea. The Last Stargazer starts the exact same way with a story of me observing at the Subaru telescope. And in my book too, something goes a little upsettingly wrong. So it was funny to see the movie start at that same place. Well, great. And you can buy the book to read more about what went wrong, right? Uh, yes, so, exactly. Much. This has been such a lovely conversation. I'm sad that we've reached the end of our hour. Clearly, we could have listened to you both for another hour. There's so much fascinating uh, banter and discussion and information that has, has occurred in the past hour. So thank you both for being here. Thank you, everybody out there in the audience for joining us on this Saturday afternoon. As a reminder, I've placed the book link um, to buy The Last Stargazers in the chat. It'll take you directly to the Politics and Prose website where you can purchase the book. And while you're there, I hope you'll visit the events page and join us at another event soon. In the meantime, stay well and well read. Thank you so much.